Well, greetings, data science fellows. My name is Gary Bernstein, and I would normally say I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, but these days I'm kind of a professor at uh, my son's bedroom. But anyway, I've managed to make a career, which maybe you can too, out of trying to measure things on astronomical images. And I uh, am always interested, and I hope to see if I can interest you too, in seeing if our algorithms and the way we are doing this are the best that they can possibly be. Are we getting everything out of the images that the National Science Foundation and the DOE paid a billion dollars for, you know, to get those images for us? So uh, this lecture is going to be about astrometry. And astrometry is maybe the oldest part of, of quantitative astronomy, right? Uh, measurements of stellar positions go back thousands of years, uh, well before there were such things as telescopes. Uh, but I'm a relative newcomer to it, and I've uh, spent a lot of time trying to get this to work on the Dark Energy Survey, predecessor to Rubin, and uh, I'll try to share some of what I've learned with you. Okay. So before we jump into astrometry, I just want to take a kind of quick overview of um, the measurements that we'll be making on the Rubin images that will fuel just about all of the science that's going to be done with the LSST survey. Okay. And uh, the, uh, the, these three rows of this table show you the three major kinds of astronomical measurements. And they're actually quite closely related to each other when you think about it. And the first one is the flux, which we know is the integral across the sky of the surface brightness or intensity of the light collected on the detector at uh, position X and Y. So measuring the total flux is, of course, you know, that's really important to do for stars. It's uh, point sources. It's really important because, you know, you need that to measure those fluxes and the colors that come from them to make HR diagrams, study stellar evolution and populations, all the transients that uh, uh, Ruben is looking for. You know, you're looking to measure light curves, which are fluxes versus time. You want to use standard candles. You need to know their fluxes to great accuracy, right? If you're a solar system astro astronomer and you're, you want to find a minor planets and measure their fluxes to get their colors and their rotations and everything like that. So uh, lots and lots of well-known uses for stellar fluxes. And uh, then uh, galaxies, we also want to measure the fluxes of resolved sources so that we can measure the total light and the colors of galaxies. And that's going to tell us something about their stellar populations and their redshifts, right? The second row is the positions, the centroids of the light that we receive from objects. And you can write this as almost exactly the same integral as the flux, but you just stick an x or a y under the integral and then normalize by the flux to get the centroid or center of light of the image. Right? So uh, for stars, this is what astrometry is. Right? We're trying to measure the position in the sky to great accuracy. And, you know, we don't really care that much about the positions of the stars themselves. What we care about is mostly how they change with time. That is, uh, can we see the parallax motion from the Earth's orbit, right? And uh, parallax is going to tell us stellar distances. And then we could also measure the proper motion or the drift across the sky, which we can pretty much treat as a linear function of time. And that tells us what the transverse velocity of the stars are. And so obviously this is of huge interest if you're studying galactic structure or dynamics. Parallax is the basis of the distance scale, so that's important too. And if you are a solar system astronomer again and your point source is a minor planet, you want to know its positions to the best possible accuracy so that you can determine the orbit of that object. Okay. Uh, now as far as resolved sources and galaxies, um, actually I don't think anybody really cares about the angular positions of galaxies to great precision. If we took every galaxy that LSST measured and moved them all by a half an arc second or something in a random direction, I don't think any of the cosmological or extra galactic results would change. Okay, so we won't talk about the positions of galaxies. Now, relative newcomer to the scene though in astronomical measurements are these things that are the second central moments of the intensity where we can put x squared plus y squared in here and that will give us a measure of the size of our galaxy 
and then these x squared minus y squared and 2xy, those quadratic moments will tell us something about how out of round and what direction um, is the major axis of this galaxy. And those quantities, these so-called size and shape or ellipticity, are extremely important. They're the basis of my favorite science topic, which is weak gravitational lensing, where we use these sizes and shapes to infer the, um, the gravitational potential on the line of sight to galaxies. All right. uh, and you know, since point sources basically have no intrinsic size or shape that a telescope like LSST can see, we can't resolve it. Now, I don't think anybody intrinsically cares about what the, um, the shape of a point source image is, except as we need to know the PSF to measure the shapes of galaxies accurately or uh, do photometry. So you've had uh, one lecture from Adam and another coming up from Colin about this box, the fluxes of uh, point sources, which we call stellar photometry. The lecture today is going to be about astrometry of point sources, which is this box. And then I will give you another lecture later that will cover these measurements of galaxies. All right, so let's dive into astrometry. And before we dive in, get in too deep, let's get a feel for what kinds of angles uh, are interesting, right? So for instance, um, suppose that you wanted to try to measure the distance to a relatively nearby star, say 100 parsecs away, by using its parallax. Well, at 100 parsecs, a star's annual wobble across the sky will be an ellipse with a semi-major axis of 10 milli arc seconds. And of course, if I put that star another 10 or 100 times farther away, I get down to one milli arc second or 100 micro arc seconds, right? So parallaxes for disk stars, we're talking about milli arc seconds. And uh, if we want to measure proper motions of stars, let's think of a star that's moving relative to our sun at a typical disk velocity of 20 kilometers per second. Well, if that's a kiloparsec away, it's going to move at about four milli arc seconds per year. So again, it's a few milli arc seconds. Keep in mind that the LSST survey duration is 10 years, so we'll see a 40 milli arc second motion over the 10 years. And halo stars, uh, you know, which are moving faster but are farther away, end up in a similar regime, okay, of uh, apparent motion. Right? Now, just to show something else. What is the actual angular size of the sun as viewed at these distances? And you could see if we put the sun out somewhere in the disk, its angular diameter would be 10 micro arc seconds. So that's very much unresolved at the angular resolution of uh, about 0.7 arc seconds, right? That is intended for LSST. So it's a really good approximation for us to treat these, um, the stars as point sources in LSST. And we won't talk about that anything. More. I'll just mention that there's one other really enticing science target for astrometry, for precision astrometry, which is to measure, detect extrasolar planets, especially distant giants, by the fact that they're tugging on their stars and making those stars appear to wobble. So you can ask if I had a Jupiter mass star around a solar type star at 100 parsecs, and that was in an orbit with a period of five years, so that, say, the LSST survey could see it go around twice. That would cause that star's wobble to appear to be just 30 micro arc seconds. In fact, it's less than the, that wobble is less than the actual diameter of the star. So if you want to do extrasolar planet hunting with astrometry, you have to be targeting micro arc second regime. So milli arc seconds for uh, st stellar uh, dynamical quantities of interest and micro arc seconds if you want to uh, you know, push the limits here on distant stars dynamics or try to start to do extrasolar planets. Let's compare that to some numbers for the LSST camera. All right, the field of view is three and a half degrees, which we can write as about 13 million micro arc seconds. So I just want to point out that if you're trying to, say, measure the proper motion of a star at a milli arc second per year, you're looking for it to move 10 to the minus 7 of the field of view of the camera each year. So it's a very high precision measurement that we're trying to make, relatively speaking. Um, now, the LSTST camera's 
or the Rubin Observatory's point spread function, or PSF, has about 0.7 arc second uh, full width half maximum on a typical night is what we're hoping for. And if we turn that into a sigma of an equivalent Gaussian shape, we divide by 2.35 and we get something like 300 milli arc seconds. So that's the size of the blobs whose positions we're trying to measure. Uh, a single pixel of the LSST camera spans 200 milli arc seconds in the sky. And I just want to disabuse you of one uh, misconception that a lot of people have. The size of the pixels on a camera has actually very little to do with the accuracy of the astrometry as long as the pixel size is um, comfortably below the size of the optical PSF. Okay, So I will mention this pixel size here. Um, and you might want to keep it in mind, but remember this will probably not enter into any of our calculations of how well we can measure positions. But uh, you can see that if we want to measure a few milli arc seconds, we're talking about measuring things to an accuracy of um, a percent or less of one pixel. Okay, so you might ask yourself how we can do that, and we'll get back to that. I just want to point out that if you're trying to do things like um, look at extrasolar planets, then you're trying to measure things at a few micro arc seconds, and now you're asking yourself whether the image of that star is moving by roughly one silicon atom's worth of uh, one silicon lattice spacing on the CCD. You know, you're, you're trying to do an extremely high precision measurement. Okay, so uh, keep that in mind, right, you know, and we're going to be dealing mostly with milli arc second scales here, right? Now, if you want to do astrometry, there's two things, there's two major steps. First, you have to take your picture and get the picture of your star or your, your asteroid and figure out what is its central location on the image. So we want to, you know, what XY pixel coordinates uh, should we d designate as a center. So that's what we would call a centroiding algorithm to do that. And that's what I'm going to talk about first in the next batch of slides. Uh, and then once you've got the pixel position on your image, there's another part of astrometry, which is to create the map that says which pixel position corresponds to what actual right ascension and declination up on the sky. And that is to say you want to create what's often called a world coordinate system or WCS which is just a function that takes these two numbers and maps them to these two numbers. And that'll be the latter part of this lecture. Now let me just say that astrometry uh, has historically had two different flavors. There's what's called relative astrometry, and that's where you're mostly interested in the relative positions of a few objects in a small part of the sky. So if you were trying to watch one star orbit another, right, you would only care about the displacement between them. And relative astrometry is relatively easy compared to what's called absolute astrometry, where you want to know exactly what right ascension and declination that thing is at, right? And that, for instance, is what you would need to know if you want to track an orbit of an asteroid across a big chunk of the sky or something like that. Um, and so there used to be a distinction where this absolute thing was harder than just doing relative. But in the last few years, the distinction between these, at least as far as something like LSST is concerned, has disappeared thanks to uh, the greatest astrometric achievement of all time, which is uh, so far, which is the Gaia Data Release 2 catalog. So here's the Gaia satellite. And uh, about two years ago, they released a catalog of uh, positions of over a billion stars in the sky, all of which are measured to uh, 500 micro arc seconds or less accuracy. So essentially Gaia can tell us for about one square per arc minute in our image um, where that star is to quite good accuracy. So if you can do relative astrometry to a star that's uh, or a group of stars that are a few arc minutes away, Gaia can take you the rest of the way to get you to absolute astrometry because it will tell you the exact coordinates, right? So I won't talk about this distinction anymore. And uh, we, uh, you know, the, the existence of Gaia DR2 really multiplies the value of something like LSST tremendously.
All right, so before I end this intro, I just want to start with the simplest case of a centroiding algorithm. Uh, what we're interested in is, let's just uh, think in one dimension. We'll think of a one coordinate x, let's call it declination, right? And uh, what we have is a bunch of photons arriving from this star. And let's imagine that the detector can tell us what the apparent x coordinate or x pixel coordinate of uh, each incoming photon is. Well, you can see then that what we're really trying to determine is the position of the underlying star that's been blurred out a bit uh, by, let's say, a Gaussian with some with sigma by the atmosphere and the optics. Well, what we're interested in is where is the very center of that distribution? Okay. And uh, this is a perfect analogy to the case, you know, a standard measurement thing where you're trying to measure the length of a stick and you measure it a bunch of times and there's a measurement error on each one. And what do you do to get your best measurement? You average them. And what we know is that the, um, the error in the mean of a bunch of measurements, of n measurements, is um, the error of each one divided by the square root of the number of measurements. So we can say that the error in the uh, measurement of the exposition of a star is the width of the PSF divided by the square root of the number of photons that we receive from that star. Okay. And by the way, um, the signal to noise ratio, if those photons are arriving and we wanted to measure the flux, then we know that if you got n photons, that the uncertainty in that was square root of n. And so we talk about the signal to noise ratio as being n over the square root of n, which is equal to the square root of n. So this Greek letter nu will be my shorthand for signal to noise. And what we see then is that if we have the simplest measurement, we're just collecting photons from a star, then the formula for the accuracy of the position can be written as the width of the PSF divided by the flux signal to noise or the so-called significance of the star. And what we'll see is that this formula here is just about all you need to know about measuring astrometry uh, off an image, uh, that this is a rule of thumb that holds uh, quite generally, that the measurement of the centroid, that error is the size of the PSF divided by the signal to noise. Okay. So with that, uh, I will stop the first fast a batch of lectures here and there are problems that you can go ahead and start doing now. In this bit of lecture we're going to look at the methods for taking an image of your star and turning it into the x and y position in pixel coordinates of that star. And we saw at the end of last time that in a simplified case where we have a detector that just is catching the photons from your source and is recording the x position say of each one that the estimate that you can make of the position of the star itself would be simply to take the average of all those x positions of the photons or the centroid and that the error as we see here on that position sigma x would be the width of the PSF sigma divided by the significance of the detection which is also the square root of the number of photons. Now let's move on to some more realistic and complex cases. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is to go into two dimensions and introduce the idea of pixels rather than individual photons, right? So we're going to have pixels that are numbered by x, y uh, that tell us how many photons fell into a particular bin of the detector, right? So it's, uh, it's a count of photons, right? We'll assume that's in units of photons. Uh, and things that, you know, we might, uh, I will interchange these notations of taking the integral over the plane or taking the sum over these pixels. Uh, for example, the estimator of the centroid, the x part of the centroid, can now re be written this way, the sum over all the pixels of their x times their value divided by the sum of their values. And the denominator here is, of course, a measure of the flux, right, if you just add up the pixels. So the next complication that we want to add is that there is a sky background where we know that the pixels are receiving photons not just from our star but also from the atmosphere or you know zodiacal dust or whatever right uh, now as Yusra explained and we we can subtract that sky level 
right? And hopefully we would do a good job so that the average value of a pixel that doesn't actually have a star in it would be zero. But you cannot subtract the noise, right? You are left with the noise, the Poisson noise from those pixels. And so that's going to add a variance to the about the zero to every pixel about its true value um, that is given by n, the number of sky counts per pixel. Also, uh, if there actually is a true sky signal, a star, say, uh, that's giving some i hat signal in that pixel, it has Poisson noise. So we can write that the sigma or the variant, the, the RMS of a given pixel is going to be the square root of the signal plus this background noise n. Right? Now, the formula that we've looked at already it assumed that n was zero, and that's what we call the source-dominated regime, and that would, of course, apply to bright stars. Right? or the brightest, very brightest galaxies in the sky. Most of Rubin's targets, though, are going to be uh, in the background limited regime where the number of sky photons exceeds greatly the number of source photons. And so we would be dominated by N here. And that's the case that we'll look at most of the time. Now, for the Rubin Observatory, if you're looking on a dark night in the R band, the transition from sky to background dominated occurs between about 20 and 21st magnitude. All right, so now we have this um, variance from the background in every pixel. And if we look at this integral that we had to do, right, or this sum over pixels that we had to do to make our, uh, our centroid estimate, and now we ask what's the variance of this sum? Well, uh, if we call that sum mx, the x moment, its variance, we can use standard propagation of errors to see that that's going to be x squared times the variance of the pixel, which is n in the background limit. And so here we see a sum that's just going to keep growing and growing and growing without bound as we try to grow the sum over all pixels. So our centroid estimator that we had before would actually have divergent or infinite noise when we introduce uh, non-zero background counts. And uh, you know we don't like that. Okay, so we have to think up another way to estimate the centroid that works when we have background noise. Now, uh, in the next few pages, I'm going to say a bunch of things about what are the best ways to make these uh, centroid measurements. And there's a lot of equations here so that you can follow the derivations of what I'm going to say if you want to on your own time in the notes. I'm going to skip most of it, you know, in the interest of time and just say what the results are and give the ideas, all right? So in order to get ourselves out of this infinite noise dilemma, the first thing I want to do is change our definition of how we find the centroid. And the first thing I'm going to do is introduce this x moment, m sub x, and it's always defined relative to some reference point x naught, and we define it to be this, the sum over the pixels of their values times x minus x naught. And what we're going to say is the true center of this object is the value of x naught that makes this moment become zero. Okay? And in fact, there's another equivalent moment for the y direction. And so this is going to be our new definition of what the center, the true center of the object is, is when we know these things. And it's easy to show, it's in the algebra here, that this criterion and this one are actually the same. For the case of no background noise, uh, that works. Now, let's think about limiting the number of pixels that we put into our estimator. Uh, so to do that, I'm going to take this definition of these moments here written as an integral, and I'm going to introduce an aperture function, capital W, that's also a function of x minus x naught and y minus y naught. So these moments here are always measured about some reference point, which I've marked by the crosshairs. And we could choose this aperture function to be something that cuts off at a maximum radius, say, R0. And then we would be doing this sum over only the pixels that are inside the circle. Okay. And this green dot here is my you know, artistic rendering of some stellar image. And uh, if we were to choose a top hat function, which is basically uh, one inside the circle and zero outside, then what we can see we're doing is calculating the centroid relative to the crosshairs right, inside the circle. 
And what we're going to do is slide that circle and crosshairs around until the centroid comes up zero. Uh, and that's going to give us our true centroid estimate. So this becomes now kind of an iterative or null finding solution instead of just a, a single integral it can do. But of course, the upside is that it doesn't involve infinitely many pixels now. So the amount of noise that we have in this aperture moment is finite and we can control it. And it doesn't have to be a top hat yes or no window. It could be a shaped window, for instance, a Gaussian uh, that I have written here. All right, so here's a graph showing how we're going to slide this window around in X and the moment is going to respond according to some curve that I've drawn in purple pink here. Uh, and what we're looking for is the place where the curve crosses moment equals zero and that is what we're going to say is our centroid. Right. Um, now there is noise on this moment on MX plus or minus sigma MX. And we can see, I think, that the turn that as we shift this purple curve up and down by that amount of noise, the zero crossing or the location of the centroid will shift by sigma of the centroid, which is equal to the noise in the moment divided by the slope of this line dm dx. Okay. And I uh, there's some equations here that will show you that uh, the noise in this moment, as we expect, if I'm using a top hat aperture it gets smaller and smaller as the radius of the aperture shrinks, which is good, right? That means lower noise here. But once this aperture starts to get smaller than the stellar image itself, the denominator goes to zero and the noise blows up. So if you're going to decide what top hat aperture to use, what we're going to find is the same thing that we found when we were doing aperture photometry, which is that you want to choose, if you want the best accuracy on your answer, you want to, or precision at least, you want to choose an aperture radius that's comparable to the size of your stellar PSF. And uh, there's some equations here that show what kind of sigma x you're going to get. And actually we find that once again it's going to end up being something uh, like the radius of your PSF divided by the signal to noise in your flux. Okay, So that's uh, a flat aperture. Now a top hat aperture is probably not you're going to be your best choice. Um, a better aperture in almost every case is to use this Gaussian shape. And uh, in fact if you are if you have a Gaussian PSF you can show that the best aperture to use is a Gaussian of the same size. And you can use a Gaussian aperture even if your PSF is not uh, actually a Gaussian. You'll still get an answer. And even though it may not be the best possible aperture, it's actually usually pretty good. So any of you who use Emmanuel Bertin's S-Extractor software to measure images, you'll note that there is something called X-Win and Y-Win image available to have it measure for you. And those are precisely these Gaussian windowed or uh, aperture centroids and uh, I recommend using them um, uh, you know they're they're pretty generic and pretty useful and pretty close to optimal in most cases right now if the PSF is Gaussian what I'm showing here are the formulas that we can derive for exactly what Sigma X is when the PSF and the window function are both chosen to have this Sigma PSF and uh, you can see here that this ends up being uh, equal to the size of that PSF divided by, again, this optimized significance, and uh, a root 2 shows up here. Okay, so these are the formula for uh, Gaussian case. All right, All right so uh, the next thing we want to ask is, are these apertures, uh, or even a Gaussian aperture, are they the best that we could do, the best way that we could measure the position of a star? Right. So here I want to introduce something that Adam alluded to and tell you a little bit more about it called the Kramer-Rau inequality. This is a wonderful tool, a great theorem that tells you what the best possible accuracy you can get on estimating some parameter from data is. Right? And the theorem works like this. Uh, if you have some data D, and for us D are the values, the i, x, y's in our image, 
and you're trying to fit it to a model. And for us, the model is that our star is a copy of the PSF in a certain place, X bar, Y bar with a certain flux F. So then it has parameters, three parameters in the case of us, the flux and then the centroid. And then whatever estimation method you come up with to try to figure out what the theta i, the parameters of the model are, will yield uncertainties on parameter i, called sigma i, that cannot be any less than one over this f, which is called the Fisher information on the um, uh, on the, that parameter. And f is just one component of a Fisher matrix that you can make for all of the parameters. And if you have parameter i and parameter j, the Fisher matrix is defined this way. It's the second derivative of the log of the probability of the data with respect to your two parameters. Okay. So this is an extremely useful formula. It tells you, doesn't tell you how to get the best answer, but it tells you what the best possible answer uh, is, or at least that the best possible answer is no better than this number. Okay. So let's apply this to uh, our um, centroids. What is the uh, the Kramer row bound on sigma x? Right. Well, our data, as I said, are the image data, and we have this model that the the flux should be equal the uh, pixel data should be equal to the flux of the star times the PSF times x minus x naught uh, of x minus x naught y minus y naught, where x naught and y naught are the center of the star. Well, I need to have a probability and I'm going to approximate the probability of getting this data from this model by a Gaussian. Actually, it's a Poisson function if we're doing, uh, if we have Poisson noise, but this is very close and accurate. And uh, here's our Gaussian, right? Data minus model squared over sigma squared. And I can actually go through and take the derivatives and calculate the Fisher matrix. And what we find is that fxx, the Fisher information on the x location, has this formula. Right? You can see that it involves the flux squared, the noise in that pixel, sum over all the pixels, and then we have this thing that's the x derivative of the PSF squared. All right. Now let's look at our two limits. We have one limit where this sigma squared xy is actually equal to the flux times the PSF itself. And then this becomes the formula for the Fisher information. And the best possible noise level for x, remember, is 1 over the square root of this. And here's the formula that we get for uh, the um, background limited case. Now, let's talk about another thing that's related to our photometry talk, which is we, we uh, heard already that a good way to measure stellar fluxes is by PSF fitting or model fitting, because the PSF is our model of a star, right? Um, and in PSF fitting, you would uh, take, again, the log of the probability, which is essentially the thing called chi-squared here, right? And we find the best model by minimizing the chi-squared. Well, uh, I won't throw, go through the equations, but you can show that the criterion that the model is minimized is exactly the criterion that uh, this thing here is zero, which we can recognize as precisely our windowed x moment if we set the window or aperture function to be 1 over x times the derivative of the PSF with respect to x. Okay? So what this says is that uh, um, model fitting and aperture centroids are actually the same thing, okay? uh, at least in the background limited case. Right? Uh, and uh, also, just in the case where a Gaussian uh, is the PSF shape, you can see that uh, the derivative of the Gaussian times 1 over x is the same Gaussian back again. Right? So this tells us that model fitting of a Gaussian PSF to a star is the same as doing a Gaussian weighted aperture centroid. Uh, and for a Gaussian, we can actually do these uh, Fisher integrals, right? And I've done them, and uh, here's the formula in the source-limited case. 
what we find is that the best possible sigma x is just the PSF size divided by the square root of the flux. And that was our very simple estimator that we came up with at the start. And if we have a background limited case, then we get back uh, this estimator, uh, this, this error level, which is um, in fact what, uh, what we derived earlier for the case of the Gaussian, uh, the case of the Gaussian PSF and the Gaussian window. So uh, what we see here is that the Fisher matrix gives us a lower bound on sigma x, which is the same as sigma x that is achieved by this Gaussian windowed uh, or model fitting um, method. So this tells us that we have indeed found a method that is as good as it can be for measuring centroids. And in fact, um, more generally, uh, you can find, you can show that the PSF fitting method always attains the Kramer round bound, or it's called saturates Kramer round. So, so uh, what it tells us is that PSF fitting, which in background limited cases is equivalent to using a weighted aperture that's given by the derivative of the PSF, that's the best you can do. So that's the algorithm we should use, right? All right, so here's a summary of all that math and everything. Uh, once again, the Kramer-Rau theorem tells us that the best possible sigma x is given by this expression, once you know the PSF. And in the background limited case, this is equivalent to doing aperture centroiding. In the Gaussian PSF case, the optimal weight is the exact same Gaussian as the PSF itself. And for most ground-based PSFs, I haven't shown this, but the precision of using a Gaussian aperture PSF is actually quite close to what you would get from the, um, the true optimal. And so it's really uh, easier to just go and do this Gaussian weighted centroid than to use the PSF fitting sometimes. Um, so that's not a bad idea, right? And just to summarize one more time, the rule of thumb that you can remember above everything else is that the error in the centroid is pretty much equal to the size of your PSF divided by the signal to noise of your detection of the star. All right, that in hand, I just want to point out a few things about these resulting formulas. So uh, here I uh, will remind you that the number of photons that are received <coughs> um, by a uh, telescope by the focal plane in a certain exposure of length t in a telescope with area A at a star of flux f, quantum efficiency epsilon, bandwidth of filter delta nu over nu, uh, can be written this way in the source dominated limit and can be written, sigma x can be written this way in the, um, in the background dominated limit. So just notice one thing that uh, here we have a error that's going to increase as one over the square root of the flux as we look at fainter stars. So that's proportional to 10 to the 0.2 times the magnitude of the star. The background limited case is more interesting. Uh, it is one over the flux. And that means that if I have a star that's half as bright, the error in its measurement is going to be twice as big. Even more interestingly, notice that there's a sigma squared here and a t under a square root down here. That means that if I, say, uh, double the size of my PSF, that's the same as uh, I'm going to need 16 times, 2 to the 4th times, as much exposure time to get back to the same accuracy on the centroids. Right? So uh, astrometric precision is very sensitive to the seeing. One exposure in half arc second seeing is as valuable as two exposures with 0.6 arc second seeing or four exposures with 0.71 arc second seeing. Right? So this is uh, you know, something that's important. And also, once we get into this background limited regime, the performance degrades towards fainter stars more quickly than it did when we were source dominated. Okay, the last thing I want to do is kind of take these lessons that we've learned and feed them back into thinking about Rubin Observatory. And I won't go through all this stuff here, but I've written down some salient facts about Rubin, like how big the PSFs are expected to be, <clears throat> um, how bright the sky is, etc. Uh, and what I can 
conclude here is that the division in R band between um, source limited and background dominated is about 20.7 magnitude. And at that magnitude, the signal to noise of a, um, of a star in a single LSST visit is close to 200. And if we plug into our rule of thumb here, we find that a star that bright will be uh, measured to an accuracy of three milliard seconds in each direction. So that's in our interesting regime, right? We were looking for milliard second accuracy to do this stellar stuff. And if we compare it to Gaia, which right now is the goddess of astrometry, um, they only look at stars as faint as G magnitude, which is similar to R magnitude, of about 0.4 milliard seconds. Uh, and so for a 20th magnitude star, Gaia's end of mission accuracy is about five times better than we roughly estimate here we would get from a single visit of LSST. So it may sound like Gaia is better, but remember LSST will visit each part of the sky hundreds of times over two years, close to a thousand times, over 10 years, sorry. Um, so if we're not limited by systematic errors, if we're just limited by this photon noise, then we will obtain positional and proper motion uh, accuracy on stars that is significantly better than Gaia, even for the stars you know, that, that Gaia can see. And of course, fainter than 20th magnitude, Gaia doesn't say anything. So that's all LSST territory. So this is really exciting to think about. Next time we'll ask, could we, are we really going to be able to use all this precision? So in our last part of the astrometry lectures, let's take those x, y pixel positions that we so painstakingly uh, obtained using the methods of the previous lecture. And now we have to come up with a function that goes from the two dimensions of pixel coordinates x and y to two other numbers, say right ascension and declination, that describe the position on the celestial sphere. Now we could have a whole other lecture really about different coordinate systems on the celestial sphere, but I'll just say that uh, at the modern day, pretty much all the coordinates that you should get will be in this International Celestial Reference System, which is ICRS or ICRF. Okay. Uh, so I won't say anything more about that. So our job now in making this WCS is essentially to undo what our instrument and the atmosphere and everything else has done to this photon between the time it entered the solar system and the time that it was read out as a value in a certain pixel of our detector. So let's take a, a short journey, you know, imagine like Einstein did that we're riding a photon and uh, let's see what happens to us as we ride a photon that's arriving into the solar system from another star from a particular direction. And we're going to ask what kind of things can change our direction of travel. So uh, the first thing that might happen is we uh, will undergo some gravitational deflection by the gravity of the sun or even of the planets. In fact, the Gaia spacecraft can actually detect the gravitational lensing due to the Jupiter, believe it or not. Uh, and then as we arrive at Earth, our apparent direction will be altered by something called stellar aberration, which is uh, an effect that you can study in special relativity that's because the Earth is moving at a finite speed. Then once we enter Earth's atmosphere, uh, the air does not have an index of refraction of exactly unity. It's slightly more than unity. And that means that there's some refraction that changes the direction of photons as they come down to the surface from outer space. And an important thing to remember is that that index of refraction of air is wavelength dependent. So this means that different colors of photons come in to your telescope from different apparent directions. That's very important that we'll get back to later. Anything that depends on wavelength is called a chromatic effect. And this particular effect is called differential chromatic refraction. All right, then uh, also going through the atmosphere, we may pass through some layers of atmospheric turbulence, which is this uh, random process, right, of, of motion of air that puts little bumps of index of refraction changes in the atmosphere that will cause further deflection. Of course, those are the same bumps that cause seeing, but they also cause the star's positions to wiggle around. Uh, then once we hit the telescope and head down to the focal plane, we're in the process of mapping a spherical sky onto a flat focal plane. 
And there is, uh, by definition, a geometric necessity that there is some distortion in that map because you can't map a sphere into a plane. Okay? But the optics of the telescope can sometimes add additional distortion terms to that uh, necessary geometric distortion. And if there's glass in the optics, its index of refraction also varies with wavelength. And so we can get something that's called lateral color, which is the chromatic effect of uh, uh, refracting optics. Finally, the photon arrives at the focal plane and uh, it, you know, we have to know something about where each CCD is in that focal plane. And then when it hits, that photon is converted into an electron or actually a hole in the silicon. And those holes go from the top of the CCD, they drift downwards to the bottom of the CCD where the, uh, the pixels are defined. And there can be electric fields in the CCD that move the holes sideways before they're collected. That'll look just like an optical distortion to our image. And then finally, those pixels that are defined on the back that say, you know, which, which pixel you read it out in, they may not form a perfect square grid because photolithography is not a perfect process. All right, so after hearing that list, uh, you could say, oh my God, you know, that you make your head explode. How on earth are we ever gonna figure all this out and then undo it to take this final pixel position and turn it into the original direction in the sky? Well, the uh, answer is that we're going to get a lot of help. We have a lot of information in every exposure about what the WCS is. For one thing, there's about 10,000 Gaia stars on every LSST camera exposure. There's about one of them per square arc minute of the sky, remember, and that's when you're off the galactic plane. As you get to lower galactic latitudes, there are even more. Another source of information that we have, though, which is in fact actually more powerful, is that uh, this, a given star, each time we look at it, it should have the same RA and DEC, modulo its very slow proper motion and parallax changes. Okay? Uh, so for instance, in when, when I was doing calibrations of the dark energy camera, we would undergo these uh, series of so-called star flat exposures where we would take the telescope and just jiggle it around in a sequence of 20 or so exposures in a given filter to take a given star and move it around the detector to all these places. And so if we're going to make some kind of least squares solution for this world coordinate system function and all of its free parameters, we can uh, ask that that solution enforce that though all those images of that star come back to the same point on the sky, as well as that every Gaia, uh, Gaia star agrees with where Gaia told us it is to within Gaia errors. Okay. So this WCS is actually turns out to be just a, a great big least squares solving problem. Uh, it's not trivial to do because we're going to involve many millions of star images to derive it. But it's perfectly doable, and uh, the software to do that for LSST is under development. Okay. All right, so uh, this is you know, not a new idea. This has been done before. And uh, the nice thing is that this magic function that we have to come up with, most of the effects that we just talked about are pr relatively smooth, meaning that they change smoothly from one end of the field of view to another. Another way of putting that is that they can be described with relatively few degrees of freedom or free parameters in a WCS function. In fact, all the ones that I've crossed out here, uh, one, two, three, five, six, and seven, they are all very well described to our millisecond accuracy that we need, or, or actually better than that, by say a third or fourth order polynomial function that runs across the X and Y CC, uh, uh, coordinates of each CCD in the camera. Okay. So once you realize that you only have these few dozen maybe uh, free parameters to constrain for each of the CCDs and you have you know hundreds or thousands of reference stars to use there, this becomes less of a head exploding problem to uh, more of a well okay I guess we can you know grid it out and do it kind of problem. So that's in fact what happens. Uh, this is, you know, kind of the standard form of WCS solution is essentially this polynomial function. Okay. Uh, there are a few things left here that don't quite fit that function. Well, I'll come back and talk to them in a minute. But first I want to mention that for you as a user, 
where how do you get these functions? Well, they come back to you. Uh, usually when you get an image from an observatory, you're getting it in the FITS standard. And there is a FITS standard for encoding the WCS equations into the header keywords of that image. Okay. And this standard allows you to build these polynomial distortions. The standard actually doesn't allow some of the other kinds of distortions that exist that I'll talk about later. So LSST will be going beyond this FITS standard in a way, but uh, that's not your problem to worry about. Uh, the nice thing is that you get these images from the observatory with the WCS and the header. And DS9, the popular image display program, knows how to read these and calculate that function based on them. So that's why when you move your cursor around on DS9, it can tell you not only the X and the Y coordinates, but it can tell you the RA and DEC of your, of your cursor. Okay. And also, AstroPy is our great friend because it also knows how to read and execute these standard fit standard WCS solutions. In fact, I'll give you some practice doing that on one of the workbooks okay, that goes with this. All right, so let's get back to some other things that you have to worry about if you want to be a grade A astrometer. All right, um, that solution that you get from the WCS will not be accurate to the milli arc second level that we think our images can provide us positions. One of the reasons is this thing called differential chromatic refraction or DCR. And uh, here's a little cartoon showing you what that means. That if you have the light coming from a star towards your observatory, when it enters the atmosphere, it's bent towards the vertical by the refraction of the atmosphere as the index of refraction goes from exactly one to 1.005, I think it is, or something like that at near sea level. And the thing is that the air, like most materials, has a wavelength-dependent index of refraction. And this graph here, taken from a Josh Meyer paper uh, and website that you can reach here, shows you how much that uh, refraction is going to change okay, as you move across the Rubin uh, band passes. Right? And you can see that it's quite substantial if we're, say, at a zenith angle of 30 degrees. That's the red line. And you can see it's pretty flat here across the, uh, this is the U, G, R, I, Z, and Y bands. And so in I, Z, and Y, it's pretty flat, but it's still changing with color by many arc seconds. And then it gets really steeper as you go into especially the G and U bands, right? So uh, if you were actually looking at an object, say at an air mass of 1.4 or 45 degrees zenith angle, this picture shows you that actually the star would look to be in different positions by um, you know, many arc seconds here as you go from Z to U band. Now we only observe in one of these filters at a time, but the point is that say if you're looking at G band, it's actually got a finite width, right? And uh, the bluer part of the G-band is up here. The redder part of the G-band is down here. So the average position of those photons is going to be up here if you have a source whose spectrum tilts up towards the blue. And it's going to be down here if you have a source whose spectrum tilts down towards the blue. So you have to know the slope or the color of the object in order to undo this differential chromatic refraction. And this is not a tiny effect. All right, so uh, in the G-band, if you're looking 45 degrees from zenith, um, you change the color, the G minus I color of your source by one magnitude, you will move that image by 45 milliarc seconds, which is many times larger than the, you know, one or two milliarc seconds that errors that we think we're going to get from photon noise. Okay. So these chromatic refraction uh, effect, it's essential that you know the color of your object and make a correction for it on top of what that image header WCS says if you want to get a truly accurate position. And I'll mention briefly that there is an analogy to this that occurs called lateral color that occurs because of differential refraction actually in the glass of the prime focus corrector of uh, the LSST camera as well as pretty much any other camera that has glass in it. And here's a map, for instance, of the deflections, uh, not to scale here, but here's a scale bar showing you that in the DCAM on the Tololo 4-meter telescope, uh, that effect in G-band is about 50 milliarc seconds per magnitude of color in, uh, at the edge of the field. Okay? And uh, just like the atmosphere, the glass's index of refraction changes very rapidly as you move into the blue, 
in our band, that signal is uh, much smaller. Okay. All right, so the nice, the good news about that is that the color terms are also smooth, right? And by looking at, say, Gaia stars that have different colors, you can measure the amplitude of those chromatic effects, right? So we can calibrate them, and then we just have to worry about, for our other sources, what are their spectra, and do that integral across the band pass, and we can figure it out. All right, so now that leaves us with two problems out of my long list that we didn't solve yet. Uh, one I'll come back to in a minute, that's the turbulence in the atmosphere. The one I want to talk about now is the, uh, what actually happens in the CCD itself after the uh, photon is turned into a charged particle. Okay? And these can have, unlike you know, something like uh, optical distortions, these effects can vary very rapidly across the field of view. In fact, they can wiggle many times between two Gaia stars, so you can't use Gaia. Uh, the Gaia stars or even you know, the other stars in a single exposure to calibrate this. But the good news about these electric fields is that they stay the same for essentially all the exposures of the camera. And that means that we can combine the information from many exposures to map out these electric field effects. So this is just a quick illustration here of how an electric field that has a horizontal component across the CCD, you know, shows how the path of our photoelectron will be bent as it travels from the light exposed side of the CCD to the place where the pixels are formed. Just to give you some examples of that, here's a flat field image from one of the DCAM CCDs. And you can see that it has this weird uh, pattern that's called the tree ring pattern. And it actually has to do with the way the silicon crystal was grown uh, by the, um, you know, to make this CCD. And uh, what we were able to show is that these rings are actually associated with displacements of the, uh, the charges and therefore of the images of the star themselves that will form this back and forth wiggly ring pattern. Okay, each little green arrow here is uh, the motion of the stars in one part of this array. And uh, you can see that this is not tiny, okay? It's up to uh, 15, sometimes larger, milliard seconds, which again, is a good deal bigger than the errors that we could hope for in our uh, shot noise, okay? So just to give you a sense of that, here is sort of a radial plot of this wiggly function versus distance from the center of the tree rings. And you can see these wiggles going up to 30 milliard seconds or more. After we try to calibrate this, and uh, you know, take it, make it part of our WCS map, uh, so that we can, um, you know, you take put this into our astrometric function. The green dots here show the average of a bunch of stars errors after we've tried to make that correction. And what you can see is that we are able to remove this kind of static wiggly map to better than one milliard second precision. And so we can uh, we can expect we should be able to do this on LSST as well. I'll just show you one other fun thing. If I now uh, take uh, several tens of thousands of exposures from, um, from DES and I average them ac as according to their position on the CCD, we get this little thing here. You can look closely and see that these are a bunch of green arrows that, that each have length of a fraction of a milliard second. And uh, that's a pattern that's somehow left over in, this, uh, in our CCDs after we take out those rings. And uh, the interesting thing is if you take the divergence of that vector field, it uh, looks like this here, and the curl is zero. And I'll let you think about electrostatics to think about why that might be the case, that this is a purely curl-free pattern. And then another interesting thing is that this is what the, uh, the CCDs are glued onto. And you can see that this pattern here comes directly from the piece of metal actually that's glued to the back of the CCD. So I'll let you think about why that's the case. That's cool. All right, the last thing left on our list then is this atmospheric turbulence. And this one is uh, a real pain because it varies pretty rapidly across the array, but it's also stochastic in time. So what pattern of turbulence one exposure sees will not tell you anything about the pattern of turbulence in any other exposure, right? We have to do this correction exposure by exposure. Let me show you what this looks like. Here is the vector diagram of displacements on a randomly selected 
<clears throat> decam exposure. And the green little arrows are showing you which way the stars move on that part of the focal plane. And you can see that these little green arrows are not tiny. They go up to, you know, 100 milli arc seconds or more. Okay. And in fact, in the DES images, uh, the RMS amplitude of this stochastic atmospheric turbulence signal is oh, about maybe 10 milli arc seconds per coordinate. And... Uh, we can expect that LSSTs will be similar. All right. So this thing will dominate the error budget of most of the stars. Right? If we get all those other corrections right, we're going to have this source of atmospheric noise left. And of course, this is why Gaia is so successful. One of the reasons is it's in orbit. It doesn't have to deal with the atmosphere, which has been bedeviling astrometers from the ground for centuries. So an interesting thing about this pattern is we once again take the divergence and the curl and we see that this is uh, actually a curl-free pattern. Again, I'll let you think about why that's true. And uh, the divergence part is streaky. And what we think is happening is that there's a turbulence pattern in the atmosphere that's being blown across the field of view of the telescope uh, in the duration of the exposures. All right, so what are we going to do about this? Well, one thing we could just do is eat it uh, as is. It's a limitation uh, that for many stars will dominate the shot noise. Uh, the good news is it will be random, so it will average down as the square root of the number of exposures that you take. Uh, but on the other hand, it's noise that we would like to reduce. And now we're kind of at the research phase. I'll just show you. Uh, something that I've been working with an undergrad, uh, actually just graduated, Willow Fortino at Penn, and uh, she wrote her senior thesis about trying to use the Gaia stars where we know what the arrow is to try to interpolate this turbulence pattern to the location of any other star or galaxy in the image. That is to say, what can we say about this pattern by just using the Gaia star knowledge? And what she was able to show is that the uh, variance of this turbulence can be reduced by about tenfold if you do this. Okay, so here's just a plot uh, from her thesis where we're showing the variance that is the squared, the mean squared error from turbulence before doing the Gaussian process. And then on the y-axis is the Gaussian process corrected. And uh, each mark here is one exposure's experiment. And you can see that typically we're seeing a tenfold reduction. Okay. Now the square root of that is going to be the reduction in the RMS. So what we think we're going to end up with in an LSST exposure, we're still working on this. This is preliminary, but we're hoping that we can reduce the residual, the uh, effect of, or the unknown part of the atmospheric turbulence to about two or three milli arc seconds RMS per coordinate. Okay. So, Here's the bottom line on WCSs and astrometry with Rubin. Okay. Uh, we hope that we can calibrate Rubin quite well astrometrically so that we our position estimates will be limited by two fundamental unavoidable sources of noise. One is shot noise, random arrival of photons. And we've seen that we have algorithms that reduce this to the theoretical minimum level. And of course, the brighter the star, the smaller the shot noise is. And at R of 20, we expect it to be maybe one or two uh, milli arc seconds. And of course, this depends on the seeing quite strongly. It also depends on how bright the sky is, for at least the faint stars. The other unavoidable form of noise is atmospheric turbulence. Again, something that's random. You can't predict it. Uh, we're still working on getting the best possible removal algorithm for this. We're not sure how close to optimal we are yet. Uh, this effect is independent of source brightness. So for the brighter stars, atmospheric turbulence will dominate. And it will be, we think, maybe two or three milli arc seconds per visit if we can make this out well. And it also depends on how turbulent the atmosphere is. Okay, so it'll differ from exposure to exposure. So we are looking at doing successful astrometry at the couple of milli arc seconds level probably for a lot of stars on each exposure. That's not as good as Gaia which is working at the half milli arc second or less level but on the other hand 
we have about a thousand measurements of every part of the sky by the time the LSST survey is complete. And if we can average those down, all of these errors go down by the square root of a thousand. And that will make Rubin a revolutionary instrument for stellar studies, it, half the sky at least, and really revolutionary for orbital measurements within the solar system. Now, you as potentially a user are going to have this WCS function that you can use if you have some object you want to remap. You get that with most observatories. And in fact, what we can expect is that the Rubin will provide you with a chromatic corrected uh, position for each object. We hope that I hope that at least that that will be an observatory product. But these chromatic corrections are essential in order to get anywhere near this couple of milli arc second uh, accuracy. So just remember that when you're using the WCS in an image, that there is a part of this that's not sitting in the header of your image most likely. You're going to have to know something about your color of your object to get its position to the highest accuracy. And in fact, these chromatic corrections in the long run might be the thing you know, that limits the accuracy of these 1,000 exposure averages. All right, so uh, I hope you find some appreciation at least, if not actual use, for high precision astrometry in your Rubin Observatory science.